So what do you want me to say about the thing? Yeah, so uh, what is this uh, play about and what are you doing here? Why do you decide to do this? And uh, how is it different from uh, the normal mythological plays that Girish is so famous for? Right. And so, so let us just <coughs> go through this whole thing. Sure. Now, we know Girish Kannada as, as an uh, eminent playwright mm. who tried to reinterpret the various mythologies mm. from a very strong feminist perspective within the mythology and questioned the established morals and everything using mythology as a clever one. Mm. And I think uh, he, uh, over a period of time he outgrew that. He started uh, also getting highly concerned and disturbed by what was happening in the ever evolving urban space. Mm. You know, the kind of politics which was being played out, the kind of social dimension that was changing, ever changing, especially in the last 25 years mm. due to globalization and liberalization. A lot of changes that happened in the city space. And he found that very interesting. Mm. He, I would presume, uh, look at it as urban mythology mm. instead of what you call the Vedic mythology. Mm -hmm. He was looking at it as an urban mythology. Okay. In the urban mythology, there are a lot of myths about the city, about people. And he probably wanted to dig deep into those myths about people, hmm. people who are cultural elite, hmm. people who are impoverished, hmm. people who are corporates. Impoverished uh, both uh, financially as well as in, the soul, in the soul? In the soul also, yeah, yes, okay. absolutely. Okay. People who are the corporate, corporate uh, czars right now hmm. and uh, people who are uh, the middle class aspirants right now hmm. and people who are absolute working class but equally burning with aspirations mm. for a better life. Mm. So he wanted to explore all these characters, all these dimensions. And he thought that Bangalore is a wonderful place to set uh, this this play. In. Because, because, because of the melting pot that it is? Absolutely. Because uh, uh, all over the world, Bangalore was looked at mm. as the center for IT revolution. Mm. Or let's put it that way, a revolution which was which started with knowledge but brought in the big bucks mm. and those big bucks started the uh, the new imperialism or new capitalism of our times mm -hmm. you know where okay. multinationals came in mm. uh, knowledge information everything started getting outsourced mm. capital started moving back and forth mm. and a uh, lot of lives changed mm. to be uh, to be uh, fair a lot of middle class people got a chance to actually get rich in mm. the dot com revolution mm. the uh, the the entire uh, service industry which uh, took over our uh, financial uh, sector hmm. in terms of shopping malls and restaurants and all hmm. gave a chance to a whole lot of low middle class and working class people hmm. to uh, to get into the service industry and stuff hmm. so lives changed uh, cross migration happened migration increased tremendously hmm. earlier there was a one way migration of uh, rural to urban hmm. which was basically agrarian related hmm. you know the failure of agrarian sector brought hmm. them over here mm -hmm. but now it was not just the ag failure of agrarian sector but pure aspiration Mm. The, the the aspiration of uh, being part of an urban space, you know, uh, even in small towns and villages, there are people, youngsters watching television, watching um, visuals of a city and having a certain aspiration of getting out of where they are, imagining that the space in the urban city is so much more better because what, what they're getting is they're getting consumerist images mm. so, and they're consuming it. And this consumption is creating this impression in their heart and mind that Better life is there in the city. Mm. Better life is being part of the urban development. Now the point is Girish was also subtly through the play of Boil Beans and Toast questioning the mode of development that we have adopted. Mm. Because there's a character in this play in the end he says, he talks about this machinery which is building roads, yes. building uh, flyovers, building all this stuff. Mm. And he's, he's looking at this thing like a grotesque monster. He's saying I'm fascinated by this machinery, this 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 the cement mixer, earth diggers. But when he says this is a grotesque monster, yeah, uh, don't you think that with, the, with so much brouhaha about the development models and all, yeah, yeah. he's a little bit, he's, he's getting a, a bit anachronistic. He's moving against the times or something like Not that. Not really. This or is it far too Euro European or? No, no. He he's he's raising questions through this character. Mm. This character is from Western Ghats. Mm. He had a television at home. Hmm. In the television, he used to watch these buildings. Hmm. He used to watch these glass-fronted corporate buildings. Hmm. And he used to get fascinated by it. Hmm. He outgrew his humble dwellings of a village, of nature and everything. And he started aspiring for cement and concrete. We city dwellers, hmm. 
Mm-hmm. We from the middle class city dwellers aspire for trees, mm-hmm. aspire to go to holidays to nature and all that. But they who are part of the nature and have seen poverty and seen povertyian politics, mm-hmm. they aspire to come to concrete and all. So this is the cross migratory aspiration that human beings have. Mm-hmm. That is why when a person comes from the lap of nature in the villages into the city, mm-hmm. he ends up creating filth mm. accepting filth mm. being part of the cement and concrete with great glee mm. because he has come from the other space whereas we the, the, the general perception is that if you come from a land of greens yeah. and 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 so much of breathing space you yeah. get claustrophobic and you get yes. uh, so that is then, our so this is that the is our utopia so, that is yes, yes. the elitist utopia yeah. that we those who live in surrounded by concrete chaos and traffic jam mm-hmm. we aspire for space and this thing and all and those who come from the space and greenery and all that stuff mm-hmm. they aspire for this model of development mm-hmm. but it is not their fault it is not our fault the model of development has been thrust upon us mm-hmm. i believe mm-hmm. we have not created a balance of nature we have not created a balance of urban development with enough concept of space and and sort of respect for nature mm-hmm. we have not created a, an ecological balance even in urban life mm-hmm. and the economic that is because of the economic model we have chosen that the economic model is a one way street it is a model of greed consumption and sort of destruction of nature mm-hmm. and building and building and building and building without any agenda what is the agenda that if you build a flyover uh the cars will move faster mm-hmm. so those who use public transport they will still move in the same streets yes. still crowded buses yes. how does the flyover help the bu- ones who are moving in buses it doesn't because flyovers are not used by buses not by the larger public it's used by those who drive the car so the corporates will reach their office faster they will create more profits transnational profits mm-hmm. and they'll shift it there so if you really break it down from micro to macro this is what you get so that's why this character who dreams of concrete cement wants to make it in bangalore city at any cost comes here fails in the end suddenly this realization hits him hmm. that when he gets exploited by the elite in the city hmm. he looks at the cement mixer and says that is also an instrument of exploitation mm-hmm. the the earth digger has got fangs and claws according to him hmm. and he asks what are they here for are they here to make me feel as if this chaos this mess has some meaning mm-hmm. what meaning does it really have and he asks a question that the city is full of people and they are constantly you know driving forward mm. they are constantly fighting with each other trying to get ahead of each other mm. why what is this push and pull what is this anger frustration what is this drive mm. this chaos what is this about why are people so chaotic why this crowd wants to just keep moving moving what But is he also a part of that chaos and he's he wants to become a part of the chaos exactly only when he is hit hard yes. then this kind of realization realization comes yes. and he questions this what hmm. is it what drives these people what what makes this city work tell me something there was an interesting uh, uh, thing where this mother in law Yes. Mrs. Padubidri. Yeah. Uh, she used to borrow money from the money lender yes. to the tune yes. of two and a half lakhs yes. and yes. Yes. spend all on gambling, yeah. horses and all. Yeah. So, uh, I just I don't know. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. But what's your interpretation? So this squandering of money yeah. has it to do anything as a as 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 uh, what should I say as something uh, that you you know you squander your life yeah. and you squander your life for for. unnecessary things or material things so is there a pointer in some way not really i think uh, what he did <laughs> was just a story you know he's he's did a very clever thing what he did was the archetype image of a grandmother mm. is the one who's got beads in her hand mm. and keeps sprouting religious yes. mantras mm. and lives a life of other worldliness mm. completely out of the material world mm. but here is a grandmother who has probably lived a life of sacrifice mm. and deprivation for a certain amount of time mm-hmm. because her son actually comes from a humble background yes, and then makes yes, it big yes. and now he she gets a chance to immerse herself in the material world and she wants to know that mm. so she is a bhogi okay so in a way she moves from yogi to bhogi mm. she experiences the higher life mm. to the fullest and realizes that it doesn't completely satisfy you mm. there is a point till which it will give you pleasure mm. and after the pleasure is over mm. you will have to seek some more answers mm-hmm. within yourself and that is why you have a scene where she says that my horse almost won and i saw a glimpse of god in the yeah. success yeah. but thank god it didn't win yes because had it won i would have lost my belief in god how did you <laughs> how do you sort of prepare for this character i mean because there were so many shades plus you played uh, three four characters yeah. one obviously was more overpowering than the others yeah. but then how 
what exactly did you do as a human being and as an actor as a reader right. uh, how did you prepare well i generally believe in one thing that uh, as an artist first and foremost you are a student of life hmm. if you are not a student of life hmm. i personally believe that you cannot be an achieving artist mm -hmm. you may be a successful artist mm -hmm. in terms of what you sell but you may not be an achieving artist mm -hmm. in terms of achieving the truth mm -hmm. now student of life doesn't mean only observing life that is a very big part of it student of life also means borrowing from other people's observation okay. other people what they have written other people what they have documented that is also a source of mm -hmm. information knowledge and all so these two observations your own senses eyes which you observe life with and what you gather from other people's observation they help you mm -hmm. and i have always observed different classes of people all the time and i make it a point to also spend a lot of time mingling and interacting with different classes of people i do not restrict myself to my class mm -hmm. i don't have the arrogance to restrict myself mm -hmm. to that class mm -hmm. i'm always i use a lot of public transport i speak at length with an auto rickshaw driver or a taxi driver even a bus conductor a shopkeeper i enjoy talking to the security guard of my building and the sweeper of my building i love it mm. and being being an actor i always try to see their perspective mm. so if their mistake has been committed i always try to understand their perspective why would they do that a person is lied to make some money but why would they lie mm. does he not understand that it can harm him in long term mm. instead of short term what is it that drives him to get short term profit instead of long term all these things moral question i try to understand all the time So in this particular play, I played three different classes of people. Yes. I play a small role of a brigadier, hmm. of an old, the one who belongs to the older elite of Indian yes. cultural space. But in the newer uh, cultural space, his elitism or his power structure, he's far below in the power structure, and yet retains his arrogance, hmm. whatever. I play a low middle class to middle class person um, who comes from a small town village. into the city and wants to make it in the anglicized society in the it sector mm. and dreams of mm. all kinds of and he thinks knowledge is his wealth mm. and i play a completely rustic character who wants to migrate to a big city and be part of the big city syndrome mm. who is violent who is aggressive so there are all these characters have different rhythms all these characters have different perspectives mm. perspectives which they carry from their own background mm. and aspirations which alter their perspective from time to time Mm -hmm. and many times some characters may not have enough scenes to reveal mm. all the repository yes so you have to achieve the entire history in one scene mm. from one particular scene the audience is supposed to gather the entire history this exactly character. where i was coming to is yeah. that how difficult is it to sort of switch <coughs> on switch off see you play a kannadiga yeah. and then you play a tamil which yeah. is a rustic guy that you're yeah. talking of and the english they speak yeah. you 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 make sure that they sound different because yes. the mother tongue influence changes so how difficult it is to you know switch on switch off uh, get you know transit yes. to, to to how see, this there's transition? a lot of craft involved in this yeah that's Frankly. a craft thing yeah so yes, you, so. one has to work on one's craft mm. you know changing a body language instantly yes, instantly you know one person stoops another person walks erect yes. the third person shuffles mm. this is a body language that mm. you have to develop and that comes to your craft yes. similarly the voice you know the pitch of the voice which mm -hmm. you work upon yes. some some person speaks rapidly some person speaks stutteringly mm -hmm. some person speaks evenly mm -hmm. so for that you have to understand the rhythm of each character mm -hmm. if you understand that every person has an inner rhythm mm -hmm. and if you catch that inner rhythm you will be able to imbibe that and develop it within a character mm -hmm. every character has an inner rhythm it is that inner rhythm which drives the way he is going to walk the way he is going to use his gestures the way he is going to speak fine okay those are the things so you have to touch upon these things apart from of course mapping a person's cultural economic and social history, history yes. and that they you have to absorb in terms of your information hmm. and with that map you hmm. create a what you call a physical genealogy on stage hmm. of course on stage you also have a wonderful technique which is called suspension of disbelief yes so you are able to convince a person mm. that you are in a elite house mm. or you are in a slum yes. or you are in an office where you are actually on a stage mm -hmm. and that is completely the art of theater which mm. you borrow from fine thank you so much thank you I, I, and and all the best for your next uh, you know venture. ventures thank you thank, thank you so much. thank you